It is less than two weeks to the governorship election in Anambra State, and this meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security is held at the headquarters of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to appraise the security situation in the state. Attending the meeting are the National Security Advisor, the INEC Chairman, heads of security agencies, including the Anambra State Commissioner of Police. Insecurity in Anambra State has been a major concern for the Independent National Electoral Commission and that concern still exists less than two weeks to the election. INEC is determined to proceed with the Anambra State Governorship election as scheduled. The safety and protection of voters, our personnel, accredited observers, the media and materials are cardinal considerations in any election. We have been assured by the security agencies of a secure environment for the election. I'm sure the CP Anambra State in his briefing will provide more details regarding preparations on the ground. However, the National Security Advisor gives security assurances while warning those behind violence in the state to have a rethink. I don't think it will be helpful to anyone to go out and ignite something that might cause pain for the people of Anambra State. For the security agencies, they've been warned. Any rogue element that decides to behave in a manner that will tar our collective institutions in a very dark color will be brought to justice in accordance with the rules of those institutions. Over 2.5 million registered voters are expected to participate in the Anambra State Governorship election, but many believe that the current security situation in the state, if left unchecked, can cause voter apathy. Hopefully we are not done with uh, e Naira. We we'll still hope to come back to it as soon as we have the CBN. But for now, let us have a conversation with Alfred Anunubo, who is a forensic security expert, concerning the uh, Southeast security that's been in the news for a while. Thanks for joining us this morning, Mr. Anunubo. A quick one. What's your take on that conversation that you just saw, that meeting that held yesterday? Um, um, very much um, good morning to you, and um, thank you for having me on this morning. Uh, just like um, everyone else, and everyone else. Uh, you may have muted yourself, uh, Mr. Onubo. You want to try again? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, we we share this concern, and I think it's mutual. Um, considering the developments over the period in Anambra State, um, people are concerned about the safety of the process and also the people that are addressing the issues, should also um, weigh the, the situation uh, from, a, from a point that is going to help us. First of all, insecurity is not exclusive to just elections. There's a general um, fear. People feel that they are open to threats and they are unprotected. And um, it didn't just start with the election. It's something that has built up over a period of time, not only in the East, but of course, it's a global concern. So Nigeria is not an exception. Now, for the Anambra situation, um, the government have reasons to be concerned. And also the politicians have reasons also to be afraid given that there has been this conflict that's been ongoing for a while now, and um, we've not been able to put our finger and bring an end 
to those threats, um, they have reasons to show this level of um, concern. And I want to believe that beyond the election, government should uh, put in place, you know, uh, systems to help educate the people. I think education is the secret. Enlightening the people, helping them to realize that security is not the exclusive responsibility of the government. The people themselves should be able to appreciate the fact that they have secure space to live their lives and do their businesses. So the Anambra space situation um, gives us serious concerns because the security agencies have not been able to um, put to rest the factors that are driving these insecurities. And um, I, I'm concerned. When you say factors that are driving the insecurity, one wonders if there are factors that the security agencies are not aware of. What are some of these factors, if you can shed some light? Well, of course, there's a general apathy um, with the political class in the East. And um, it might affect the entire nation, but I think there is a big question that has not been able to find answers um, based on the performances of the politicians. One is the level of poverty and unemployment uh, in that region. Now, you will understand that when people are meaningfully engaged, you minimize the threats that um, they are exposed to because a lot of the people that become uh, easy hands for crime could have or would have found, you know, sustainable means of livelihood. So that's a very underlying factor. Now, let me make it clear. Um, crime has no tribe. It's not an ethnic thing. And um, it has no political alliance. A criminal is a criminal. The only thing is that they find a vehicle that can help them um, perpetuate their crime or their, 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 you know, engage in their activities. So the political class have not been really accountable to the people, and they have no explanation um, for the level of unemployment and poverty that have translated to all manner of insinuations and um, political uh, vehicles or whatever other vehicles that people have entered in pursuing self-recognition, um, economic emancipation, and all these other things. Those are things that the critical elements driving the insecurity and that might affect Anambra State. Hmm. Well, Mr. Onugo, the question that comes to my mind from all of these things that you've just said now is, are you saying essentially that all of the peace accords, all of the security summits, all of the uh, Saudi's governor's meetings has not been able to hatch a solution? Oh, certainly. Um, you, you, you will understand, and um, I'm respectfully going to say this. A lot of the politicians in office today were probably not elected on public or popular mandates. Um, there is a role the political parties play. They bring people that probably appeals to some interests and then puts them forward. And of course, they have their machineries to provide and produce such people as leaders. Um, for people that recognize leadership driven by merit and integrity, and I think that is general, it's a global thing. Once you begin to manipulate and shortchange uh, the mandate of the people, you create um, a, 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 an atmosphere of anarchy. You, you, it might not you know, get to the peak, but it progressively gets to where it becomes um, a general issue. Uh, the, the, the process, the democratic process that are often breached in selection and election of leadership seems to be one factor, one out of many. And also that also might inform why political office holders fail to give you know, acceptable accountability of themselves. Their performances 
leaves many people with questions. That's one. Two, uh, the situation where people are political contractors, which means they become vehicles that determine who becomes party candidates and officials of government because they have the control of the resources and also influence on the structures of the system because they fund them is another challenge. So these are little, little things that are behind the build-up. So even if a credible candidate emerges, those who benefit from this other system that is uh, bereft of integrity, we definitely fight back because they don't want to lose out. They want to remain relevant. They want to also feed from the system. So I think until we realize that uh, popular mandate should be the procedure and then should be the process that produces leadership, um, we, we might have more conflicts, you know, brewing in the system. How significantly do these issues that you have raised feed into the fears being created by the threats of state at home and all those things by pockets of groups all over the Southeast? Well, you will see that there are several individuals who are working and um, campaigning to be elected to those offices. Now, the question will be, did these people come through um, an uncompromised process? That's one. Two, how will a man that spent so much to get nominated and spends fortune to get elected have the resources, have the time, and uh, be devoid of the pressure to develop infrastructures, economic, you know, uh, infrastructures, social platforms that can accommodate the enlightened and educated uh, youths. Anambra is known for, I, I mean, like I would say, anytime, any day, is the leading industrial state in Nigeria. The things coming up out of Anambra is unimaginable. And yet, a good percentage of these people are doing so on self-help. So they are seen as examples. So people tend to believe more in such people than a political office holder who is just a public administrator of resources. So the, the, the youths are caged. They are trapped. They don't see well you know, um, oiled policies from the government that guarantees them a future. Secondly, you also realize that from history, it's like whenever a new government comes, they jettison the programs that were set up by the previous uh, administration and start new ones. And many times these are just self-advertising, uh, self-publicity projects. So when that government leaves, the next administration will initiate something totally new. So the people don't get to benefit from government investment in development. So it's affecting the youth because they are the ones who can't get jobs. They can't make meet their own needs. They depend on their parents or their, 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 their family members to survive. And when it becomes a liability socially in a, in a culture where um, achievements are celebrated, success it's like a medal, a gold medal. It, it becomes worrisome. Mm. You know, uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, linking insecurity to the electoral process, and when you talk about the mandate of the people, you know, the popular mandate and, and the rest. And, you know, it's quite interesting because speaking specifically about Anambra now, Anambra is a peculiar state because that's a state where you have a party that is outside the big two, as they call it, the ABC and the PDP, uh, governing a state. So, I mean, to that extent, people will tell you that, well, clearly it would seem the party has the mandate of the people for it to, you know, wield such influence in the midst of the APC and the PDP and to become governor, not once, twice. So uh, that, that's a peculiar state. But then this is also quite interesting because from what you say, it will then mean that for us to solve the insecurity which we see, perhaps not just in the Nambra, across the country, we need to go back to the selection process. 
I mean, beyond the kinetic approach, we actually need to think back, and, and I'm talking within political parties, how, you know, leaders are elected, how they come up, people's participation in, you know, that electoral process. I mean, take a look at voter turnout. INEX says between 30 and 35 percent we had in 2019. So not enough people even come out to select their leader. So that there's a question around, I mean, just 35 percent electing a leader that will govern the whole 100 percent. But for you as a security expert, I wonder when you you're consulted because I know from time to time uh, you have to consult maybe for state executives or uh, people in government. Do you do you put these forward and say, well, let's set aside the kinetic. Let's talk about how leaders emerge in the first place. Are people happy with government? Are these issues that you bring up? Um, yes, I. When I have the opportunity, which is rare, because I think um, it, it, sometimes it's about the personality and the interest of um, the candidates or the, the winners of the elections or the politicians, if they want honest consultancy services, I'm sure beyond myself, there are many Nigerians who are as concerned as I am. Um, I'm also sure that some of them watch your programs that discusses extensive issues and subjects on securities across the board. So um, it's something that we will also be glad to help the government address. Uh, there is need for us to sincerely step back. We seem to have taken democracy from the surface. The process that generates the anticipated results are often not uh, in consideration. So it's something that um, we've had opportunity, I've had opportunity to share my views uh, with some of my friends who are politicians and um, it's, it's not easily taken because these guys are also under enormous pressures from unseen political benefactors. Uh, there are people who have survived in the system. They have no industries, they have no investments anywhere in this country, but they are billionaires. And all they do with those funds are basically to control political establishments and ensure that they remain relevant in, in, in the sharing system, you know. They are not bothered if one million youths are unemployed. Uh, they are bothered about the affluence they enjoy. They have unfiltered access to the corridors of power, and they can, you know, promise heaven and earth. And of course, when they speak, you will fall for them because by interaction, they understand the problems, but by motive, they are far from uh, a good intention to help the entire country. It's a serious concern. Not many of them are open to, even when they start opening up and listening, I think along the line, the fear of the next election becomes their concern. Mm -hmm. And gradually, they, there is a drift. They work more to be re-elected. They work harder to, be, to remain politically relevant. And they forget that when they are done with political assignments, they become part of the same society that has been neglected and uh, remained undeveloped. So it will seem uh, the solution to our insecurity is largely political, uh, I mean, from your submissions. But you've talked about elections and uh, you know, politicians, how they look forward to elections. So the Anambra election is coming next week. And, you know, this is going to be a big test not just for INEC, really. Well, INEC has said this will be embarrassingly what transparent, but also for the security agencies, for the people of the state, and by extension, the people of the Southeast, and even Nigeria. The president has said, I mean, just right after that meeting with heads of the security agencies, that, you know, that election must hold, even if it means that security agencies will overwhelm that state. And earlier on in, in on the program, we talked about the show of force as against show of presence, and that, that was referenced by Chamberlain. I'm just wondering how you expect this to be approached in terms of, if it means overwhelming the state, how should that overwhelming, how should it be prosecuted? Thank you very much for this question. First of all, I'm glad I have the opportunity to respond to this. I think our security agencies must realize that they, are, they belong to the people. They are part of the society. And we should use our security agencies to create some level of education and enlightenment. There must be 
um, a, a heart and, um, and mind kind of approach to security operations. Um, we don't just operate on a platform of enforcement. No, the security system should be part of the education. They should interact with the society. Their presence should be felt in schools. Security officials or agencies should be part of the education system in Nigeria. I don't see what is wrong if we assign policemen to go to primary schools, secondary schools, as teachers, universities, as lecturers, basically bringing home the, the essence of the criminal justice administration system. Now, when people see you only when you manage threats and um, dangers, they, they form a mindset. They don't see you as an essential part of their social life. They don't see you as part of those who are contributing to their understanding of life and the society. So I think the militarization of security agencies should be de-emphasized. Our security agencies must be seen as friends, like there is a, a, a popular advert that the police uh, uh, is your friend. Um, that's, that should be the actual culture. They should be interactive. They should be involved in the society. They shouldn't just have a place where you bring problems, troublemakers, and even when you go there, sometimes your crises are compounded. Like a, a leader once said, he said, once you have issues among yourselves and you go to a police station, you will never resolve it. Why? Because the system is not designed or is not operating to solve those problems, build interaction, create harmony, and get people on the side of the law. The police, the army, the DSS, civil defense, and other agencies should be involved in developing social structures for the society. They shouldn't just wear uniforms and appear or be used, because that's the wrong side of the agencies that they've not been able to address. Most often, people who breach the law because they have the resources use the agencies to enforce illegitimacies, illegalities. So this has created a stigma and then builds a wall between the people and the security agencies. So we must find a way to harmonize our operational activities and direct it to educate and inform the people. The people should be able to trust a yes from a police officer or a security agent more than they trust just any politician or anybody, including the politicians. Nobody also should be allowed to operate outside the provisions of the law. Now, we are a, a, I'll give you an instance. We are, let me even use traffic laws. We are politicians use siren and, you know, run against traffic lights in the full glare of the public with police escorts or military escorts or any other form of security escort is a bad sign, is a bad culture. We must eliminate these things. If we don't do that, people will not have that confidence that when a policeman or a soldier or any official of the law is standing, that they are safe. So we, there, are, there are a lot of moral issues. There are also professional and technical issues involved. The, the system should develop values. They should put the interests of the people above the, the, the expectations of a very few. So those are some of the things that um, I, I expect that the law enforcement agencies should begin to look at. How can they develop relationship and build trust? It's a project. It has to come from their research institutes. It has to come from uh, sociologists. It has to come from uh, the academia. We must help the security agencies to build a social bridge with our society. Now, where the security agencies are, you know, perceived as threats, people feel insecure. They don't feel the warmth, you know. They don't feel like we own this system. It's there for us. Uh, then we are far from achieving security because when threats come from both sides, sometimes you don't even know who to hold responsible. There are things that happen and um, it escalates. You'll be wondering, are the agencies fail, uh, are failing their, on their assignment or is it that the people do not even understand what the law says about what they are doing? So there's this imbalance. 
and we must bridge that gap. Well, you talked about education um, or security, security education, so to speak. It will interest you to find out that uh, in Nigeria today we teach security education as a subject, GS1, GS2, GS3. I don't know if it extends to SS. You know, a number of things are taught, including relating with security agents in school in preventing crimes and all of that. But, you know, when you talked about the policies that need to be put in place and all of that, ultimately it has to come from the same political class that you say people have issues with, people don't have so much confidence in. The election in Anambra is just about, about two weeks away. What then are the options before the people? What would the people, what do you suggest that the people should do now? Uh, Candidates have been put out there. PVCs are yet to be uh, circulated by ANEC. If they is going to be given, you know, for that soon. What, in your opinion, should the people be targeting now? There's a dilemma of security. There's a dilemma of an election that has to hold. What are the options? Well, um, I, I, I like to say that the the the, con, con, the concerns are not just about this election. We should begin to see the challenges beyond this present election. The election has to hold, and um, because it must hold, we expect that the security agencies will put in their best. They are human beings, and I'm sure they don't want to come out of that election with um, failed results. So I'm optimistic that they would use the resources within their means in terms of human and uh, material resources to ensure that um, the election comes out very good. Um, that does not eliminate the fact that there are, there are uh, opinions. There are, some, there are going to be certain challenges um, in dealing with the fear already created by the uh, issues of, um, you know, killings and attack of policemen, because these are also going to have their, you know, play out during the election. Those are the concerns. Um, a situation where policemen have been hunted down, police stations have been attacked, INEC offices attacked and all that. It's, and I'm sure these are part of the reasons why you could see all these activities around security going on. Uh, on a normal day, I don't think that would have been the case. So I also would like to encourage the traditional rulers, the town union presidents, families, you know, um, to advise their words. They are part of the system. If the traditional rulers call their people together to let them know that, look, we must do the right thing. I'm sure that people are going to be a bit more organized. And um, I don't know how much the government often involves the traditional rulers and other structures of uh, community government in the programs that they run. But this is where such synergy or relationship uh, plays a role. They should be able to use this establishment, including the churches in the Southeast, particularly in Anambra, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and Pentecostal churches are quite influential, very, very influential, and they should be consulted. They should be uh, encouraged to use their platforms for voter education, you know, to enlighten the people, also to encourage the people to be law-abiding. I don't see why these people should not be mobilized by INEC. INEC should also create awareness. Probably after this election, they shouldn't wait. They should create um, units in INE that goes to some of these religious centers, mosques, churches, you know, and other worship centers to educate the people. There should be, like I said, there should be some interaction. There should be some kind of communication lines established between these agencies and, uh, and, the, and the people. So I see that to be very crucial. And I know people respect religious leaders in the East. A lot of them say have integrity. So the politicians 
are the problem because people don't trust them. And when you associate, even the religious people are apprehensive of relating with politicians because they are afraid to be branded as endorsing a politician against the other. But there should be a neutral ground. There should be an open ground for them to address issues. Um, nothing is wrong if the state government uses the state's platform, the broadcasting, to bring the bishop of Oka or the bishop of one of the uh, religious organizations to join the governor in the state broadcast or okay. a collection of them. Whatever can be done to prepare the mind of the people to go out there to elect credible leaders will be welcomed. Well, well, the only thing we can hope now is there will be strong enough persuasion for the people to do the needful as opposed to the strong threats that they have to contend with. But in the meantime, Alfred Ononugo, forensic security expert, thank you very much for your time and thoughts this morning. It's always my pleasure to be here. Thank you.